know it today. Let's be honest. All you really want to know is how to get your orchids to rebloom, right? <laughs> that's, that's a quote from Chuck McLoon. And he's, uh, Chuck is a lifelong plant enthusiast and has been assisting gardeners since he was a child. He has a master's degree in botany and has worked in landscape design and maintenance in ecological research for several universities and as a gardening columnist, lecturer and master gardener instructor. Chuck now works independently with homeowners, helping them solve their gardening dilemmas. His book, How Orchids Rebloom was released in 2019. And that is the subject of our evening tonight. Take it away. Chuck. All right, thank you very much for having me. Um, that was the most amazing intro, Karen, um, that I've ever had. And I mean, I'll be honest, yes, I write those little intros for the Garden Clubs and Plant Society so they have something to say, but nobody's ever read one of them, ever. <laughs> the first person. Let's just like say some stuff and look at the thing and, but you actually said everything I put on there. Like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you thank you happy? for having me. Yeah, um, thank you for having me. Yes, as you soon see, I like to talk about plants. I do talk about plants all day anyway, so just get me started. But um, yeah, I've worked with plants my whole life. I actually started gardening for money over 40 years ago. I, I kid you not. And uh, here I am still today uh, doing that. And um, uh, I don't do gardening columns as much as I used to, but I'm just going to mention if you all read or get uh, California Garden. Uh, one of my articles will be in the next issue, the January, February issue, which would probably be sent out soon. I won't say what it is. It'll, that's something kind of funny. Anyways, um, but what I've been more working on, which came out two years ago, is my book, How Orchids Rebloom. And um, it took many years to finish that. Um, and since orchids will outlast us, I consider it part of my retirement plan. So um, anyways, but I spent a lot of time doing orchid classes like this. Uh, but mainly these days, I go to people's homes, as Karen said, and help them with their plant problems. And um, somebody actually asked me this past year, hold on just a second here. How do we get Karen back on the thing? There we go. Um, somebody actually asked me, what is your favorite thing, Chuck, about gardening and plants? And I said, well, my favorite thing about gardening is plants and is talking about gardening and plants. And now, especially with Zoom classes, I can actually sit down and talk about gardening. It's like, wow, this is cool. But anyways, yeah, thanks again for having me. And um, there's actually a class uh, that I did. I lived for many years in the Pacific Northwest uh, doing basically what I did here. And, um, oh, I see Rachel Cobb. Hi, Rachel. Um, and I did a class in the Pacific Northwest maybe 20, 25 years ago when not everybody had the internet at that time. And the class was called um, How to Overwinter Your Fuchsias, Geraniums, and Begonias, something like that. Um, here, we don't have to worry about that. If you live in a cold climate, you have to do something special. Um, that's why I live here and not there, uh, among many other reasons. But anyway, so um, yeah, in doing this class, I asked some the, the, the class, like, how did you hear about it? And a gal right in the front row said, well, I just typed into my computer, uh, how do I overwinter my fuchsia hanging basket? And this class came up and she drove from like 40 miles. And, and in that moment, um, light bulbs and dollar signs went off in my head. And I thought, wait a minute, you know, the way that people search for information is totally different now. I mean, think about here's this class on orchids. And, you know, if you say 30 years ago, wanted to learn about how to get your orchid to rebloom, what did you do? Well, you went to the library and you, once you got to the library, look for the card catalog. Then you went to the card catalog and tried to find a book on orchids. Then you went to the stacks, tried to find the book on orchids. And maybe there would be something in there that would tell you how to get your orchid to rebloom. But now all you have to do is type your question into your computer. And so um, if the thought crossed my mind, because at the moment, at that time, I was the general manager of a really large nursery. And I you know, kind of made the class list. We had like two classes every Saturday. And I thought, well, there's a class next month on orchids. Why don't we just call the class what people want to know and just call it how orchids rebloom instead of something like you know, orchid care and cultivation. Uh, and when we did that, the room was filled to the fire capacity. Like all these people showed up. It's like, why don't we just call it How Orchids Rebloom? So it became a very popular class. And over the last 20 years, it's probably the class that I've done the most among many other types of gardening that I talk about. And um, so after doing this class for a long time, people said, well, you ought to write a book about orchids, but, but you got to write it the way you say it. Don't write it in British. 
Somebody told me that once. I don't know what that means, but anyways. But um, yeah, so how orchids rebloom. People said I should write a book about it. It took a while, but I finally got it done. And, um, and I'm going to tell you right now how orchids rebloom. I'm not hiding anything. Um, you can go into Walter Anderson Nursery, look on the back cover of the book, take a picture with your cell phone and take it home. It tells you right on the back the three things that have to happen for your orchid to rebloom. So first, you have to know what kind of orchid you have. Then, uh, once you know what kind of orchid you have, you can find out what its native habitat is like. And if you reproduce the conditions found in your orchid's native habitat, that's number three, your orchid is guaranteed to rebloom. And the thing is, that's true for any plant. And I'll say that again. Um, if you know what kind of plant you have and you reproduce the conditions found in that plant's native habitat, it has to do fine. It has to bloom because that's just how plants and all things work. So, um, so yeah, actually, Karen, that went pretty quick. Uh, you know, that's, we can ask questions now. No, I'm joking. But that really is it. And before we got started, uh, somebody had a question about their orchid. Uh, we didn't have the video of it. And she's like, well, how do I know how to take care of it? I said, well, I don't know. You know but I was kind of joking. Well, what kind of work if she didn't know? So unless they see what kind it is, you can't really do anything. It's just going to be a guess. And so um, we'll talk more about that as we go today. So, um, but yeah, so now I'm going to give you the class that I did a long time ago before the book was done called How, how Orchids Rebloom. Nothing much has changed. Yeah, I have a few more jokes that I add in, but it's pretty much the same information as it was 20 years ago. Um, you know, how do we get my orchid to rebloom? Because that's really uh, what matters. So, um, and again, that's what matters. So how many of you would be maybe, oh, a little less excited if the class was called Orchid Care and Cultivation? I mean, that just sounds boring. And it's like Zoom class. Oh, honey, he's going to talk about Orchid Care and Cultivation. Give me my pillow real quick, just in case. It's, luckily, it's a Zoom class. You can do that. But no, we're going to talk about how orchids rebloom. We're not going to talk about the boring stuff. So, um, but the first thing in any class that I do, whether it's about orchids or fruit trees or uh, gardening with succulents and cacti, whatever it is, you have to know something about your plant. Um, you have to know something about your plant. And why is that? Well, because they're all different. And I think that's obvious to anybody here in a horticultural society meeting. And um, to drive the point home, I like to suggest, uh, you know, think about your family doctor. How many species do they deal with? One. And how much do you pay them? So anyway, make sure that you know your plant. Even my, one of my professors in grad school said, you know, before you get started, you get over there in the library and know your plant. I don't know if people go to the library still anymore. Just look it up on your cell phone. But, but anyways, um, so know your plant. What does that mean? Well, first of all, be really careful what you read on the internet uh, because, uh, you know, people mean well, um, but there's mistakes. A lot of things aren't peer reviewed. And then the other thing is the source of the information. I, I, how, many, how many times I've gone to somebody's home and they say, well, I read on the internet that if I did this, I would oh, stop. What was the source of the information? I go, I don't know. Well, you know, I mean, what somebody does to get their Cymbidium orchid to rebloom in upstate New York is probably not what you're going to do here. So um, local sources of information are best. Uh, for instance, like if you have a local um, county horticultural society and they have a monthly meeting with a guest speaker, that works. Congratulations. No, but um, Local sources of information are always best. You know, there's nurseries that have free classes every Saturday, things like that. So, um, and you can look things up like, you know, what color are the flowers, how tall does the plant get, stuff like that. But I have two notions that I talk about in almost every gardening class that have to do with knowing your plant. And, and this stuff that I'm gonna talk about now is just, I think it's kind of important. And you'll have a whole different perspective on plants in general after what I'm gonna say over the next like three minutes. So, um, <clears throat> The two things are the growth habit of the plant and what is the native habitat of the plant. So I'll talk about those two in a moment. So growth habit of the plant. What you really need to know for any plant that you mess around with or play with or whatever is what does the plant do over the course of one year? You know, when do the leaves grow? When do the leaves fall off? When does it bloom? Um, I, I used to work at Walter Anderson Nursery years ago and I kid you not, somebody called one day in um, about this time of the year and she said, oh my God, all the leaves are falling off my sycamore tree. What do I do? It's going to die. She never noticed, I guess, that in the past that it happened every year. But that's something normal. Um, or I like to tell a story about a client that I had. This is in Bellingham, where I lived in Northwest for many years. And um, I went to her house in May, I think it was. 
And um, she said, oh, we bought this plant in February for my bir uh, daughter's birthday in June. Oh, but it died. I was like, oh, what happened? I mean, what kind of plant was this? Oh, I don't really remember, but it was like um, an orange flower on a stalk. And some of you might be smiling now. And I said, what kind of, what was the name of the plant? I, said, I don't remember, but I think it started with a D. Like you're smiling really big now. And I saw, so I go, um, it was it a daffodil? She goes, yeah, that was it. And I go, well, okay. So what was the problem there? It was just lack of information. I mean, nobody is going to buy a daffodil blooming in February, expect it to be blooming in June. That's just not going to happen. I mean, you could be, have the greenest thumb in the world. That's not going to happen. And that person didn't know that. They might think they stink at gardening and never try it again. So, um, you know, information is important. The growth habit, what does the plant do over the course of one year? Um, the other thing to know about your plant and its growth habit, um, and this is especially important for orchids because it's not obvious the way it is with other plants, is to be able to differentiate between the youngest and oldest leaves on the plant. If you can tell the difference between the young leaves and the old leaves on a plant, it gives you a powerful tool to assess the health of the plant. And any plant's gonna have the, the oldest leaf turn yellow and fall off once in a while. And whether it's a palm tree or a tomato plant, it's gonna happen. And um, if you don't know that, people like, oh, I, I go to somebody's home, look at my tomato plant, a third of the leaves are all yellow. Well, it's just the bottom third. The plant's growing really big and it's shading itself, they're gonna fall off. So, but if the new leaves on any plant look damaged, discolored, disfigured in any way, something's wrong and you need to take corrective action. But just because the oldest leaf on a plant, like on a hibiscus or a gardenia, they're shedding leaves all the time. But just because one of them turns yellow doesn't mean you have to do anything different. So um, that's, again, the growth habit of the plant. What does it do in one year? And what's the difference between the newest and the youngest leaves on a plant? Because for some things like the grass in your lawn, you know, it's not obvious which the oldest and newest leaves. So that's a growth habit. The next thing then is the native habitat. You know, where is the plant found in nature? Now, where do we find it? You know, there are some orchids that grow in uh, open grasslands in the plains, you know, and then there are some orchids that live in the understory of a tropical forest in Brazil, you know, two totally different environments. And as we'll talk about, the native habitat of a plant or an orchid or anything tells you how to take care of it. So we'll come back to that. But, um, but again, where do you find the plant in nature? Um, that's one of the things the internet's good for, is you can look up a plant and say, what's its native habitat? What's its native range? Mm -hmm. And find out what those conditions are for that plant. We'll talk a lot more about that as we go today. So um, I'm really a fan of what I call gardening slogans. I guess that's my own term. But like in my book, I think I'll find it. There are like these orange boxes. And what I like to do is distill down a whole bunch of information into one to three sentences. And then... Um, you know, like there's these orange boxes. I tell people, if you just read the orange boxes in my book, you'll know way more than everybody else. But um, this is my favorite gardening slogan, and I say it probably in every class. So the goal for any type of gardening, whether it's fruit trees or orchids or whatever, the goal for any type of gardening is to reproduce the native habitat of your plant to get the desired growth habit while having fun. And if you're not having fun, you're doing something wrong regardless of the plant. So anyway, so I'll say that again. Um, the goal for any type of gardening is to reproduce the native habitat of your plant to get the desired growth habit, in this case, orchid flowers, while you're having fun. So the most common example of that is uh, camellias and azaleas. You know, you go get a new camellia or azalea, um, the nursery is going to want to sell you a bag of acid planting mix or planting mix for acid loving plants. Well, why is that? Well, it's not just some, you know, professor at the University of Nebraska in 1942 found out the pH of camellias is 5.3. You're going to get 75% more bloom. No, it's just that we're reproducing the native habitat of the plant. And that's why Japanese maples don't do well here. It's too hot. The soil's not right. And the water's not right. Um, it's one of the hardest plants to take care of unless you do it in a pot. And I, I have clients that have Japanese maples, but, um, you know, you don't see a lot of nursery selling them. But again, it's because their native habitat is not like here. And you might ask, well, what about my house plants? I don't think about that. You know, I just get a spider plant, pothos, philodendron, peace lily, bring it home. It does fine. I don't think about their native habitat. They do fine. How come that works? Well, guess what? The interior of your home is exactly like the native habitat of those tried and true house plants. Um, and think about it for a moment. You know, the room that you're sitting in right now, I'm assuming there's a window or two in there. You think about the light in that room over the course of one year, you think about the temperature in that room over the course of one year, where would you find those conditions in nature? I mean, yeah, we are in nature, we're humans, but where out there 
would you find that? And of course, if it's a live class, we could have a dialogue, but I will just tell you the understory of a tropical forest. I mean, we don't like humans. We don't like that kind of open seating bird nest type house arrangement. Nobody makes a house like that. We like cover over us and the light comes in the side and the temperature stays pretty constant all year. We're not like the bear where it gets really cold and it's warm in the summer and we go hide. And, you know, we like it kind of constant. So um, that's the understory of a tropical forest. And a lot of those common tried and true house plants, that's what their native habitat's like. And they're very forgiving on watering. So you're not gonna find a real fussy plant, a plant that needs constant water being a common house plant. It's just not gonna work. But anyways, um, so we'll come back and talk more about native habitat of the plant. But again, the goal for any type of gardening is to reproduce the native habitat of your plant to get the desired growth habit, in this case, orchids reblooming while having fun. So um, you've probably heard, you know, people get excited, oh, it's a class about orchids. And because people are excited because they've heard, oh, orchids are difficult. Well, they're not difficult, they're just different. And um, an orchid's native habitat, if you've never really learned about it, you wouldn't think of it. Oh, oh, that's their native habitat. I would have never thought that. But, but orchids are considered to be difficult for what I call um, the orchid. Uh, no, no. <laughs> no. Uh, but there's even a chapter in my book, it's a historical chapter called The Origin of the Orchid Myth. And you know, like, how come orchids are considered difficult to grow when they're not? They're just like any other plant. Um, so on, there's four things that I think um, we know now that people did not a long time ago. Um, you know, 300 years ago when new lands were being discovered and all these orchids were brought back to England and Holland and Europe, to be you know, brought back there, they all died because nobody knew anything about their native habitat. People tried all kinds of things and they died. And it turned out that only the extremely wealthy people uh, that could build big greenhouses and conservatories, the only people that could afford the expense of trial and error to get an orchid to rebloom. And so anytime in human history, when only extremely wealthy people are the only ones that can do a certain thing, a mystique will develop about it. And I guarantee you, that's why this lasts to this day. Um, and it's not like one of these Jungian archetypes of the collective unconscious that carries through. Maybe it is, but orchids are not that difficult to rebloom. They're just different. Um, as we'll talk about, it has to do with familiarity. But first of all, these four things that are different about orchids that you might have been thinking about, um, like people will ask me first light and they'll say, well, does my orchid like a lot of light or not a lot of light? Well, it depends on the type of orchid. So some orchids are native to habitats where they're in full sun. And some orchids are native to habitats that are in full shade. And if you put them in the opposite, they're not gonna do well. If you take two orchids from those native habitats, put them side by side, one of them is not gonna be very happy. So, but that's, we know that now. Some orchids like lots of light and some do not. And that's why this orchid, the Phalaenopsis orchid, is the most common orchid bought and sold because its native habitat is just like the interior of your home. Its native habitat is the understory of a tropical forest, dappled light in warm conditions. So everybody's got a place in their home for one of these to rebloom. Not everybody's got a place in one of their home for one of these orchids to rebloom, as we'll talk about later. So that's light. The other thing we know now that we do not know 300 years ago is that some orchids are native to really high elevations in the tropical climates and some are native to really low elevations. And again, if this is a live class, we could have a little dialogue, but I'll just get straight to it. The difference is those orchids native to high elevations are gonna like cooler temperatures. The orchids that are native to lower elevations are gonna like the warmer temperatures. And that's pretty simple. And if you didn't know that, like for instance, um, Ken, we're talking about having cymbidiums, I think. If you bring your cymbidium, if you bring your cymbidium indoor to try to grow as a house plant, it's never gonna rebloom. It's too warm in your house and there's not enough light. The interior of your home does not match the native habitat of a cymbidium orchid. So anyway, so the next thing, because we're talking about tropical orchids, there are orchids that are native to the United States. And on my website, there's actually um, an article I did like I think two years ago where I'm not kidding, in the mulch next to the garage in a gated community in La Jolla was an orchid coming up, the native to the southern part of the United States, right there. And so I did, took some pictures and there's an article about it on my website. Um, which is the title of the book, HowOrchidsRebloom.com. Isn't that clever? Anyway, so um, orchids in the tropics will like more humidity than found in the average home, unless you live in Hawaii. But 
or Florida. But in San Diego, you know, you have your heater, your air conditioner on, you know, parts of the year, and that dries the air out quite a bit. So if you have your orchids as interior plants, you will have to provide extra humidity. And as we'll talk about, misting is not the way to do it. If you have your plants outdoors, you might not have to do anything, especially the closer you are to the ocean. But orchids like humidity. If they don't get it, uh, some of them don't do well at all. Now, this is the, uh, one of the most important things I'm going to say next. Number four on the things that we know now that we did not know a long time ago is that orchids are epiphytes. What does that mean? It means on a plant. Most of the orchids we're talking about, not all of them, but most of them live in trees. They don't live in soil like carrots and cucumbers. So the watering is totally different. The potting media is totally different. The way you water is totally different. So um, we'll talk more about that as we go. But so these are things that were not known a long time ago. And as a result of that, orchids were considered difficult to grow. And because people just a lot of times don't have the time to learn these things, they think it's difficult. And they go, you know, and some of these orchids, like some of them like highlight, some of them like it cool, some of them like it warm. And people say, well, why does it have to be so complicated? It's not complicated. It just has to do with familiarity. For instance, let's say you just moved here from some other planet. You walk into Walter Anderson Nursery and there's all these annuals. And you think, oh, these annuals, oh, look at that. But a lot of you, I bet, already know the difference between wax leaf begonias, snapdragons, lobelia, calendulas, pansies. You know the difference of those because you're familiar with them. They're just as complicated as orchids. Some get tall, some are short, some like it cool, some like it hot, some like the sun, some like the shade. And if the annuals were like some family called coloraceae, and you'd never live in a temperate climate, you'd be pretty confused. But the opposite is just as true. You know, if this is the San Diego Horticultural Society meeting, if this was the San Diego Horticultural Society meeting of Guatemala, we would not be having this class. Because well, why do we have a class on how work is rebloom? We just put them in a tree and walk away. You know, it's not necessary. But again, it's familiarity. Now, for instance, you know, next month, uh, a lot of nurseries will have their bare root fruit trees available. How many of you are considering, let's just think about this for a moment, honey, let's go to the nursery this weekend and get an apple tree and let's get a nice pot for it. And you have it right next to your easy chair. So on Thanksgiving day, you can be picking apples. I bet nobody ever told you you couldn't do that. You just knew you couldn't do that. And again, that's a familiarity thing, but, but somebody from Costa Rica that's never been here, it goes to a nurse like, oh, let's get the apple tree. Let's just grow it in the house. Oh, you know, again, it's familiarity. I'm being silly about it. It's the same thing. Annuals are just as complicated as orchids, but they're not complicated at all. They're just different. There's just all these different kinds. And, um, but again, yeah, you could take all the orchids and separate them out. If, for instance, this was called a Phalaenopsis plant, like a poinsettia plant, you probably wouldn't feel intimidated with taking care of it. But as soon as we put the word orchid on it, people get all like worried. Oh, no. No, but it's, again, it's not that big of a deal. So here's another one of my gardening slogans. We just talked about um, things that we know about the orchid's native habitat. So all orchids fail to rebloom because some aspect of the native habitat is missing. Has to be. Therefore, if your orchid is not rebloomed in the last year or two, some aspect of the orchid's native habitat has to be missing. That's it. And that sounds simple, but then you have to like implement change using your hands. You pick the orchid up and put it close to the window. You pick the orchid up, put it outside, repot it every few years. And that's what we'll talk about next. But again, I want to say this. This is true again for any plant. You know, um, any plant fails to rebloom because some aspect of the native habitat is missing. If your plant or your orchid is not rebloomed in the last year or two, it means some aspect of the native habitat is missing. That's why a lot of tropical foliage plants don't rebloom in the container. The container's not like their native habitat. They just won't rebloom. Or they're grown inside when they could get a little more light than they'd rebloom outside. But anyway, so um, given that, now this is the most important part of the class where we actually talk about orchids. So there's so much stuff that's, if you know the intro part, to what plants are like and how they're different, orchids are so much easier to understand. So thank you for bearing with me to that beginning part, which I say in almost every class, um, because it's important to know your plant. So there are five, I find, five main reasons why orchids fail to rebloom. 
And I've answered like literally thousands of questions on orchids. And really it comes down to like five groups and it's nice to condense things into five groups. It's a nice, easy number too. Um, and actually when I was gonna start this book, How Orchids Rebloom, it's part of my retirement plan. Did I mention that? Yeah, anyway, but I was gonna call it How Orchids or Why Orchids Fail to Rebloom. People are like, no, 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 that's negative. Don't say that. So, okay, I won't do that. It's simpler anyways, How Orchids Rebloom. So these are the top five reasons that orchids fail to rebloom. There's five main reasons. And so if your orchid hasn't rebloomed, it's one of these five reasons, I almost guarantee you. And one of them is not bugs, not bugs. Anyway, so the first one is light. Um, there are many orchids that will never rebloom as a house plant because there's not enough light, unless you put it right in a window. Like this orchid here is related to the Cattleya group of orchids. It's called Lelia. And if you see the flower, it's, it's got a lot of detail. But um, funny story is one of my a client from earlier this year has a bikini store in Ocean Beach. So if you need a bikini for this winter, I highly suggest the, the uh, it's called Lelia Swim. And, you know, I had to ask her why she called her business Lelia. And we'll talk about that some other time. But anyways, I, I'll get you a Lelia orchid. So I did a trade with a trade with a friend who did a trade, and got this. And it's been sitting at home. And I finally, the spike's huge. It finally bloomed this past week. She's out of town. It's like, let me know as soon as you get back. Anyway, so this orchid is not going to likely bloom as a house plant unless you have a nice window that's bright, but not too hot. Um, this orchid here, Phalaenopsis orchid, does great reblooming as a house plant because it does not like direct sun. I, mean, I can't tell you how many times people say, oh, I just put it outside to give it a little fresh air. Five minutes of direct sun, you're going to have a sunburn on that leaf for the rest of the life of, the, life of that leaf. But yeah, some orchids do not like direct sun and some need it. So, um, but that's the most common reason that some orchids fail to rebloom is they just don't get enough light. You can do everything right. All you had to do is move the orchid three feet closer to the window, it would do fine. Um, when we do these li classes live, I often bring up the notion of grow light. Um, these days, especially here in San Diego, Bellingham, Washington is a little different, but here nobody's interested in grow lights. I'm not gonna talk about it. Main reason is not that we already have plenty of sun, is that grow lights simply don't go. And you know, like they say, if it doesn't go, it goes. And grow lights don't go in most people's home decor. Um, but I do know people who once the last child has moved out of home, gone to college, they convert their bedroom into an orchid growing space, complete fluorescent lights, ventilator fan shelves, the whole bit. I've seen it, it's pretty cool. Anyway, so that's light. Um, but again, know your plant. Some orchids need lots of light, some do not like lots of light. So number two, most second most common reason that orchids fail to rebloom has to do with how you water the plant. Now this is also linked with humidity and fertilizing because often we're putting fertilizer in the water. But anyway, um, I'll just say fertilizer first. Lack of fertilizer or not fertilizing has never prevented an orchid from reblooming. Orchids, again, a lot of them are epiphytes, live up in trees in very nutrient poor environments like most cacti and succulents. You know, cacti succulent fertilizer, the numbers are really low, or they should be, because they don't like lots of food. There's not a lot of leaf litter laying around decomposing organic matter. It's not the same thing. So um, fertilizer is not required, but you will get more flowers on a spike if you do fertilize. But it's not required to get your orchid to rebloom. Um, most orchid fertilizers are mixed very dilutely. Uh, one of the articles on my, I have a blog page on my website where people usually send me a question with pictures and I just turn it into an article with the answer. And one of them was, um, can I fertilize my orchids with miracle Grow fertilizer? I said, well, if there's an instruction on there for orchids, yes, but I bet there's not. But there is miracle Grow fertilizer for orchids. You know, use that one. Um, just make sure it's a fertilizer for orchids. Humidity, we already talked about. If you have your orchids outside, you may not have to do anything to give them extra humidity. You might, if you live further inland and you have your orchids outdoors in the summer, you might have to provide extra humidity. And one of the easiest ways is just grouping the plants together and that can give a humid microclimate in the grouping. Um, but then watering. So if light is the most common reason that many orchids, or lack of light is the most common reason many orchids fail to rebloom not the Phalaenopsis orchid. Improper watering techniques is the most common reason that orchids die. So why is that? Well, again, most of the orchids we're talking about, both of these right here, live in trees. So a lot of people that water according to a schedule or water their orchids with their other houseplants, the orchid's probably gonna die, unless they're very forgetful and watering their houseplants. Um, but 
Again, they live in trees. Orchids don't have, or epiphytic orchids do not have adaptations that allow them to survive constantly damp environments. That, there are exceptions, some do. There are orchids that are native to high elevations in South America where they're in cloud forests and there's cloud and mist all the time. Those orchids are a little different. I do talk about them in my book. Uh, the Mastivalia and Dracula orchids, um, you can sometimes find them in nurseries. They're not uncommon, um, but they need constant moisture. Again, just a reflection of their native habitat. That's not likely what you're gonna see at Walter Anderson Nursery or Trader Joe's. Not likely to see that. Uh, you go to an orchid show, you'll see that. Um, and again, a lot of the orchids I talk about because I try to reach as many people as possible, it's a little more streamlined. Like chapter four in my book is called the top 10 most common groups of orchids and what they require. Um, if you go to an orchid show, you're gonna find all kinds of other things. But most people don't go to orchid shows. So I don't talk about all that stuff because you just don't need to know that. But any you know, box store or independent garden center is gonna, if you buy an orchid there, it's gonna be in one of these top 10 groups. So anyway, so watering them. If you're not sure when to water your orchid, don't because they have adaptations to dry out, you know, dry out, living up in a tree. They don't have adaptations to being constantly wet. So the problem that happens is, well, why is it a problem after all? I mean, you're telling me watering your orchid too much is a problem. Well, what's the problem with overwatering a plant? Why, how can you give a plant too much water if the plant's 95% water? You know, really it doesn't make sense. And the reason it doesn't make sense because this overwatering is kind of a misnomer or even the idea of like watering your plant. You're not watering your plant, you're hydrating the potting media for the purposes of the roots. That's really what you're doing. And if you can get away from the, a lot of the concepts or conceptual way of thinking about it, it's a lot easier to understand. So what you're trying to do when you water your plant is hydrate the roots. If you hydrate the roots of your orchid, you know, twice a week or once a week, it might be too much. Orchid roots have this um, spongy layer called velamen on it that's designed to absorb small amounts of moisture really fast and then dry out. Small amounts of moisture and dry out really fast. The example I like to say is, if you have your kitchen sponge, what happens when you don't wring it out? You know, not so good. So, um, so what is the problem with overwatering? What's the problem? How can you give a plant too much water if the plant's 95% water? And if we're a live class, we could have a very interesting discussion there, but I'll get right to the point. Um, it excludes water. Water displaces air. So to drive this point home with a very uh, startling illustration, if I ask you to sit at the bottom of a swimming pool for three hours, you wouldn't die of overwatering. I think you probably get that one. So water excludes air. So as we'll talk about with potting media in a couple minutes, um, the purpose of any type of potting media, this is my new way of explaining soil, is to provide the proper balance of water and air for that particular plant. So like cactus succulent mix, you know, it's supposed to have good drainage. Well, why is drainage important? Because if it did not drain, air would be displaced. So cactus succulent mix is for plants whose roots require lots of air. Plants that live in a desert, there's lots of air in the soil. So um, that's what that white perlite pumice stuff is in there is to make it drain so that the roots get air, not to get the water out of the pot, that's part of it. But the main reason is because the roots need more air than a fuchsia in a hanging basket, totally different potting soil. Same thing with an epiphytic orchid. We don't pot them in soil. As we'll talk about, we use non-decomposed organic materials like bark or moss to make the orchid feel like it's in a native habitat living in a tree. So again, with watering, the most common reason orchids die is they get too frequent watering. Again, if you're not sure when to water, don't. But how would you know when to water more often? Well, here's the thing. If your orchid is growing leaves, that's your sign it's time to water it more often than you were when it was not growing leaves. And even, you know, the word grow is kind of vague too. I wouldn't say it's a misnomer, but um, this sounds kind of funny, but I do like to say it these days. Instead of using the word grow, I like to use the term biomass allocation. So that makes sense. It sounds complicated, but the term suits what we're talking about very well. If your plant is deciding to allocate biomass to leaf tissue, otherwise known as growing leaves, you better water more often than you were when it was not growing leaves. Otherwise, like we talked at the beginning before we got started about how sometimes cymbidiums don't bloom so well one year to the next. One of the reasons can be if you don't water them enough in the summer, they don't grow leaves good enough, they won't bloom that well that year, that, that winter. Cymbidium orchids, the ones with the big long leaves, 
big spikes on them. Um, they are not epiphytic orchids. They live in loose leaf litter on the forest floor, which again is not soil like carrots and cucumbers. It's a little different and we'll talk about that in a moment. So water your orchids more frequently when they're growing leaves. And some orchids, you should not water at all in the winter if they're not growing leaves. Like a lot of those dendrobium orchids, if they may not rebloom if you leave them outside getting rained on in the winter, assuming it does rain occasionally. But there can be some winters if your dendrobium orchids out in the rain, it won't rebloom because it's just going to keep growing leaves and not bloom. Um, one of my gardening slogans is with orchids, especially water the pot, not the plant. And again, with humidity, indoors especially, don't mist your plant. Um, with these Phalaenopsis orchids especially, if you get water in the folds of the leaves and it sits there overnight, that can make a condition for the plant to rot. So um, water the pot, not the plant. We really don't want standing water on the foliage of our plant. And generally speaking, that's true with any type of gardening, um, you know, it's more coastal that you are. You don't really want water sitting on the foliage of the plants. That's how you get rust on your roses and powdery mildew on your tomatoes. So uh, moving on then, next thing is temperature. This is the easiest one. Number three, third most common reason orchids fail to rebloom. And again, it's just a reflection of the native habitat. Um, I have this book, it's the Botanica series. It's these little square books that are real thick. There's one on roses, one on orchids. And what's cool about it is they tell you the native habitat of that species of orchid, like a real nice description. So, um, and in that book, it will tell you they group orchids into three classes based on the conditions found in native habitat. And it's very clever. You might want to write this one down. Cool, intermediate, and warm. Pretty clever, huh? So that's not complicated. If your orchid is native to a cool environment and you live in Santee and you have it outside and it's 100, it's probably not going to rebloom. That's pretty simple. You just need to know that. Like Cymbidium orchids. Uh, there was an article in the Orchids magazine you get if you join the American Orchid Society a few years ago about Point Loma specifically because it's one of the best places in you know the North America to grow cymbidium orchids because it's a lot like the cymbidium orchids native habitat which is high elevations in kind of subtropical environments there are some cymbidium orchids that can handle snow not the ones you see at Trader Joe's or at Walter Anderson Nursery no not those but um again you can't grow a cymbidium as a house plant expected to rebloom because it's too warm it'll keep growing leaves but it's not going to rebloom it thinks it's summer all the time so temperature is important. Um, know what kind of orchid you have. Make sure you provide the right range of temperatures. Some orchids, uh, like if you look in a book and it says, you know, for advanced growers, usually that's an orchid that has a narrow temperature range. Like the pansy orchids, uh, Miltoniopsis, they're native to moderate to high elevations in South America. And the temperature range is pretty similar over the course of the whole year from 60 to 80. And for a lot of people, like, and nobody in Texas growing a pansy orchid is outdoors all summer. It's not going to happen. It's going to die. And same thing here. Um, I think I repotted somebody's pansy orchid. They lived in Ramona. And I was like, yeah, you're going to have to have that indoors in a bright window in the air conditioning through the summer. It's going to die. So temperature is important. The other thing that's important with temperature, and this is really important. I haven't been all over the world. I've been a couple places, literally a couple. But um, as far as I can tell, it's cooler at night than during the day. Anyone second that? Pretty simple. So if you, somebody who comes home, you have work as his house plants, you come up from work and turn the heater on right now because it's gonna rain and, oh, it just started. I have a metal roof, that sounds awesome. Love that sound. Anyway, so um, if you come home and turn the heater on in the evening, that will confuse your orchids. And these orchids here, the Phalaenopsis, commonly make new spikes right now, October, November, December in uh, San Diego County when they're outside. But our winters are typically too cold for this orchid to be outside all winter. But you leave it outside as long as you can, and you bring them inside or an enclosed patio or something like that. The temperature is pretty simple. Find out what kind of orchid you have, provide the right range of temperatures. Um, next thing then, we could do a whole class just on this, is pots, repotting, and potting media. And this is a big uh, reason why orchids fail to rebloom. Usually this is the, the example where your friend at the end of the cul-de-sac has done uh, attempting orchids for the 12th time and has given you another round of three or four, and they look in pretty bad shape. And they tried to repot them, they did it totally wrong, and they're going downhill fast. So, uh, or maybe that's something you did. But yeah, repotting is really important. Uh, the pot is really important and the, and the potting media is important. So we'll talk about all those here. Again, this is the fourth common reason orchids fail to rebloom using improper pots, potting media, or repotting techniques. So first with pots, um, 
I don't have an example of a terracotta pot, but people will say, well, well, are plastic pots okay? I say, well, have you seen an orchid for sale not in a plastic pot since 1955 or so? No, the plastic pots are totally fine. Um, and why do they grow them in plastic pots? Because it's a lot less expensive and they're light. That's it. I mean, if terracotta was really light and inexpensive, they'd do that. Um, but I tend to discourage terracotta pots for one main reason. Um, if you pot an orchid in a terracotta pot, um, all the roots are going to stick to that clay. Think, well, clay breathes. That's good, right? Air for the roots, mimicking the native habitat. Yes, but you will have to repot that orchid. And as we'll talk about, the potting media we use for orchids to mimic being an epiphyte living in a tree is non-decomposed organic material. So most potting soils that you buy are decomposed organic materials for potting soil. But what we use like bark and moss has not yet been decomposed and it will decompose, which means it becomes more like soil and less like the well-drained potting meat it's supposed to be. That means you will have to repot your orchids every few years. If you don't, the roots will rot and your plant will die um, most of the time. You will have to repot them. So um, for pots, plastic pots are fine. Um, people get those really big cymbidiums. They put them in half barrels. That's fine. Uh, the main thing is you want a pot that has a nice big drain hole. Um, I don't have a, here's an example. This is my sister does pottery, June 13 pottery on Instagram, but this is an orchid pot she made for me with little holes in it. It looks like, I don't know, something kind of cool. I don't really know what it's supposed to be, but I put an orchid in it and it bloomed. So it worked. But anyways, orchid pots have the holes in the sides. Yes. Mimicking living in a tree. So the roots get air, but you're not going to put a cymbidium orchid in one of those because they don't live in trees. They live in loose leaf litter on the ground. So again, right pot for the right kind of plant. Um, the size of the pot is important too, and we'll talk about that in a moment because that's dependent upon when you repot the plant. So the potting media is important. And again, the potting media is simply to reproduce the native habitat of the plant as it relates to water and air. Now the potting, the type of potting media doesn't really matter. And usually the potting materials you find is just whatever's locally available. Like when I live in the Pacific Northwest, it's fir bark and moss, go figure. Uh, here, we tend to see like redwood bark, other kinds of bark, um, and there's sometimes moss too. Um, some of the big orchid growers are buying big bales of that stuff. Um, but the potting media, again, it's not the kind that's important, it's the grade of the potting media. So um, I've got nice pictures in my book, but I brought these to show you. I don't know if you can see that. So this is fine bark, this is medium bark, and this is large bark. And you think, okay, well, what's the difference? How do I know if my orchid is going to need that? Well, if you have an orchid that's native to those cloud forests I mentioned in the high elevations of South America, you'll be using fine bark. So there's less air spaces and more moisture is retained. If you have an orchid that lives in a, like way in the top of a tree in Australia, where part of the year it's pretty dry, you're going to use the chunkier bark. So there's more air spaces. There's some orchids like the Vanda orchids. They're just grown in baskets that have six foot roots that don't have any potting media. But that's because they're grown in the environment that works for that. Um, if you, you could probably grow anything without a pot. You could probably grow an apple tree aeroponically in the right environment. You, know, you control all that stuff. But, you know, we don't want to, that's a lot of, you know, effort and expense and everything. We want to do it easy so we're having fun. So the main thing with the potting media is that you get the proper grade for your type of orchid. The more air or the that your roots require, or for some orchids like dendrobiums that really like the winter rest, meaning they come from a uh, native habitat where the trees lose their leaves. That means it's dry. So you just have to know that about your orchid. It's pretty simple. Again, some orchids you can't leave out in the rain through the winter. Can't do that. They need to be on the dry side. Um, so that's, yeah, the potting media. The next thing then is repotting. So, um, there's two main types of orchids that have to do with growth habit. And sometimes time is limited and I, you know, didn't get too much on that, but there are two types of growth habits with orchids that determine therefore how you repot the plant. So this orchid, I'll use this one. So this is the Phalaenopsis orchid. This one does not have a bloom spike on it at the moment. And um, this orchid is what they call monopodial, meaning one foot. It has one growth shoot that makes leaves and flowers throughout the life of the plant. The plant you're most familiar with that does that would be like a king palm or a queen palm. One shoot to grow leaves and flower throughout the whole life of the plant. That's this. So this orchid will not get wider. It might get a little bigger, 
But when you repot it, you're awfully pu often putting it lower in the pot because a couple of the bottom leaves have fallen off. The top leaves should look nice, but the bottom leaf on this orchid is going to turn yellow and fall off at some point. It's going to happen. Um, the more humidity and right environment you have, the more leaves that plant will support. But when you repot this, you're going to center it right in the pot. The size of the pot is dependent on the size of the roots. You would use a pot that comfortably accommodates all the roots of this plant without too much extra space. Again, the roots like lots of air, we're repotting it to refresh the potting media, not necessarily to give it a big pot. It may not need a bigger pot, it just depends on the size of the root ball once you get it out of the pot. So that's monopodial orchids. Now, cymbidium orchids, a big like long strap like leaves, this orchid here, this Lelia or this Oncidium, have a totally different growth habit. And this is the one you're more familiar with, especially if you have perennials like Shasta daisy and bearded iris, where a plant creates a new shoot upon which to grow and bloom once or twice or 10 times a season, depending on the plant. So in this particular orchid here, this side here is the new leaves. This is the old part of the plant. This was a division from a plant, I think two years ago, and it's growing this way. And this plant, because the girth gets bigger, you will need a bigger pot at some point. Like cymbidium orchids, they need a bigger pot at some point. It's a totally different growth habit. So I hear repotting is different. But the potting media use though is specific to the plant. You know, in my book, uh, there's the chapter on this thing that we're talking about, the five most common reasons the orchids fail to rebloom. And there's all these different charts and things on the proper potting media that you need for the different types of orchids. And if you got the email with the handouts, all that stuff's on there too. So um, again, we could do a whole class on this, but when you do want to repot, is usually when you see the new growth coming out in the spring. That's a sign to repot it. When you don't want to repot an orchid is when it's blooming. You know, like they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If it's blooming, don't do it. Because when you, again, you're repotting it to refresh the potting media. You take it out of the pot and get rid of all that old potting media, all of it. So it's bare root. You don't do that with your geraniums and your fuchsias in pots. You just take them out, kind of repot them a little bit. But with orchids, we're replacing the potting media. That's why we do it. So it's not like soil and it's more like a well-drained potting media. Um, and again, you don't want to repot usually right now, unless you have an accident, you know, your son's basketball knocked your phalaenopsis off the shelf over there. Yeah. Okay. You got to repot that one, but generally you're not repotting now. Wait till the spring. Okay. So that's four most common reasons orchids fail to rebloom. The fifth most common reason orchids fail to rebloom has to do with the state of the orchid when you got it. There's so many people that get orchids from a friend, you know, they're in such sad shape. It's going to be a year or two before that thing reblooms and the best of care. Um, and some orchids are going to take longer than that. Um, some orchids like that Oncidium, if they get too rotted and they're left with one little bulby thing, yeah, it's going to be a few years before it grows enough to rebloom. So sometimes the reason an orchid does not rebloom is just its origin. Like what happened to it before you got it? Um, you know, and that's why I like to suggest if you can buy your orchids from like independent garden centers, I'm not going to say don't go to Trader Joe's, but you think about Trader Joe's, or even when I lived in the Pacific Northwest, where do they put the orchids? Right by the door. How many times is that orchid door on a day like today, or like we're going to have tomorrow? It can't be that good on the plant, getting all those cold drafts coming in 20 times a minute. So, um, you know, if you go to an orchid show, again, it's better to, if you can buy them from a local grower. Like I know the, the Scottish Rite Center, there'll be growers there from Hawaii. You know, they bring a lot of plants over. And, you know, you go up and ask them, is this orchid going to do okay for me? What do you think they're going to say? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No. If you can buy, like, you know, Andy's orchids, maybe you've heard of, they'll be there at the, the Scottish Rite Center in March for the big orchid show. And there are people that help there. It's not always Andy. Sometimes he's there. But the people that help, when you first talk to them, they'll say, what is your environment like? I mean, that's brilliant. I mean, that's what you want. Because everything we've been talking about, why even look at an orchid? unless you know it's gonna be okay for the environment you have at home. I mean, what's best, I have a whole chapter, a small one in my book on how to purchase and care for a new orchid. You know, how to get the best one. And people, how do I get the best one? Um, but when you're looking at orchids, again, differentiate between the youngest and oldest leaves on the plant. You know, if the youngest leaves, if somebody gives you a plant, what's the newest growth look like? If it's damaged, discolored, disfigured in any way, something's wrong and usually has to do with the roots. So if an orchid's having a problem on the new leaves, and this is something you might see if somebody gives you a plant, often you need to look at the roots. So there's comes back to the idea of watering. What happens is when you water an orchid too much, the roots rot and they die. The orchid begins to wilt because there's no means to uptake water. And what do you do? You water more often because the plant's wilting. Guess what happens? It gets worse. So 
If you're not sure how your orchid is doing, take it out of the pot and look at the roots. Um, if the roots are fine, they're hard, the plant's probably fine, put it back in the pot, water it. But if the roots are not fine, you may need to repot the orchid depending on the state of the roots and everything. But, um, but that's, again, the five most common reasons orchids fail to rebloom. Insufficient light, improper watering, incorrect temperature, incorrect pots, potting media, repotting, and just where it came from to begin with. You know, I guarantee you, if you go into Home Depot and try to buy an orchid, there's not one person there that's going to be able to answer a question about it. You know, you want to make sure that, you know, you get, again, local source of information are best. Um, I'll just finish on this real quick, and then we'll open up for questions. Um, let's see. On my website, there are a lot of articles on there uh, and PDFs that you can download for free. There are a lot of the articles are because I've been doing more orchid classes and other classes the last few years. Um, there's a lot of articles with pictures on orchids. Uh, one in particular is like mealybugs. Somebody sent me a photo the other day, uh, email me a photo. So if you have bugs on your orchids, neem oil is probably the thing that you will need to be using. Uh, neem oil is an excellent organic control for what they call sucking or sap sucking insects like mealybugs, aphids, white fly, and scale. And um, except for white flies, any of those three would be something you could get on your orchids. But usually if your orchid is not rebloomed, it has nothing to do with bugs. It has to do with how the plant is being cared for and whether or not the native habitat is being reproduced for the plant. And again, if you know what kind of orchid you have and you know what the native habitat is like and you reproduce the native habitat for that plant, it is guaranteed to rebloom. And that I guarantee you is how orchids rebloom. So if you want to ask Wonderful. questions, fire away. I'm, I'm going to ask a question. The, the, um, you didn't talk about the vanilla orchid. And can right. you just for me, because it's an herb and in what I love, I got a vanilla orchid in Cardiff years ago. And I knew it would never get vanilla beans off of it, but it was just fun to have. And Why do you say that? Killed it. Well, well, because that's what I was told. <laughs> on the internet, right? No, no by the no. people I bought it from. <laughs> okay, so ask this. So again, so this is a good question because I don't talk about vanilla orchids in my book because it's not one of the top 10 most common groups. Like if you go to an orchid show or you go to Andy's, yeah, you might find a vanilla orchid or people pass around cuttings. It's easy because uh, vanilla is a type of orchid. It's the only orchid of commercial importance other than what we see as, you know, flowers in that because, yeah, the fruit of vanilla fragrance or vanilla planifolia is vanilla, that dried seed pot of that. So how do you take care of that? Well, based on what I said, you all would immediately say, what's this native habitat like? So what's, where's the native habitat of vanilla? Where does it grow? Tahiti, uh, Hawaii. Well, it's not native to Madagascar. Hawaii. But yeah, it's South American, Central yeah. South American. So um, basically, if you think of what Florida is like, they'll do just fine. Like if it was not as cold here, it rained and was more humid, Vanilla orchids would be in every tree. Everybody picking their own, anyway. But all the commercial vanilla is grown in Madagascar, almost all Madagascar. of it. Okay. Yeah, and um, they're grown. That's you know, it's complicated because they have to hand pollinate all the flowers. They're grown in mm -hmm. trellises, so the pods hang down, and then they go along and collect them all. And that's why they cost so much because there's a lot of labor involved mm -hmm. in that. And that's why it was such a prize in like such I think Central or South American, um, you know, making chocolate with it. You know, because you had to find one of those things. But anyways, if you can provide warm conditions that tend to be humid, um, those orchids will be fine. So a lot of people say, oh, I want to get a greenhouse. I might, this is just a silly opinion, but most people want a greenhouse to say they have a greenhouse. Uh, greenhouse is a lot of maintenance. As soon as you enclose it, you get bugs in this climate and you spend most of your money running a fan to ventilate it for eight months out of the year. But a greenhouse would be a reason to grow a vanilla orchid. Because it just outdoors, it's, it might be a little too cold. But, I, yeah, um, warm, humid. Okay. I, I will consider that and maybe and do they'll it grow again. well as a house plant, you know, in a nice, like a, like a sunny uh, kitchen window where the sink is. I've seen people have them like, you know, just pin it up on the window and let it run around in circles. Yeah, it might not bloom, but it'll keep growing. Super. 
Um, one of the questions, and then I'll get to you, Donna. I see that hand. Okay. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, so Mary uh, Mitchell is asking, what kind of orchids are fragrant, and if those would do well in San Diego? Yeah, and again, there's uh, orchids are as diverse as plants themselves. And so um, there are some types of orchids of which there are fragrant cultivars and species, and there are some types of orchids where there are not. Like this orchid, the Phalaenopsis orchid, most of them are not fragrant. You think, well, why did God make it that way? Well, we can't have everything. So anyways, <laughs> you know, one flower could last five months on this thing. But um, these are, you will occasionally find a fragrant one. Like I, I go into Trader Joe's once in a while, and occasionally there'll be one of these. Usually it's a smaller one, and it'll be fragrant. Um, a lot of the um, members of the Oncidium Alliance are fragrant, and a lot of them can rebloom as a house plant um, easily in San Diego. Like the Cattleya Corsage orchids, um, a lot of those are very fragrant. All the different types of Oncidium orchids, those do really well here um, outdoors and in trees too. Okay, yeah. good. Donna. Okay. Well, first of all, let's go back. Somebody had typed the question here real quick. There was a question somebody had typed, and it said, why do the new leaves on my Phalaenopsis orchid look shriveled? So somebody oh. had typed that question. I'll just answer it real quick. I don't know, because I can't see the plant. But like I said, if the new growth on your orchid looks damaged, discolored, disfigured in any way, take it out of the pot and expect the roots. If the roots look okay, then there's something in the environment that's not right. Like a common reason a new leaf can shrivel is if it's been outside and it got too cold. That could happen. Usually you see black spots too. But if the new growth looks shriveled, usually it means water gets set in the folds of the leaves or the roots stay too wet, meaning they did not get enough air. And so that would be the starting point for that one. So then um, Donna, yeah. you think that's what you were saying, Karen? She had a question? Yes, um, I, I'm, I'm trying to translate this to epiphyllums, which are now known as epicactus. So I'm thinking they must, since we pot them in similar pots, they must come from a similar place. So what orchid would, would an epicactus be like? Well, first of all, so epiphyllum, um, there's mm -hmm. an epiphyllum society. And I will say this, yeah. I you know, do talks for different garden societies. The epiphyllum society in San Diego is the coolest group of people of any plant, plant society I've ever gone to. When I went to the Orchid Society the first time, the only person that confronted me was somebody that recognized me from the Epiphylum Society and said, hi. Yeah, we, Anyways, have, a speak, we have a speaker coming from them uh, next. Yeah, well, they're an awesome so, group of people. So Epiphylums are not orchids. Many times people right. call them orchid cactus because they grow in trees. No, now, I there didn't are many, think of that. I, I yeah, was just so thinking that- Epiphylum. Yeah, the pot is, uh, the pots that we put them in are uh, the growth, um, material that we put them in, the media is similar to what we put, what you said some orchids go in. So I'm wondering which orchid would be similar in its, in its natural oh, environment. Right, good point. Yeah, so an epiphyllum, I would, you know, I use like cactus mix for that or um, like cymbidiums being semi-terrestrial, meaning they live in loose leaf litter. Mm -hmm. The potting media for cymbidiums is often a mixture of small bark and compost. Yeah. And it just depends on where you grow your epiphyllums. I mean, again, they're not orchids. They are cacti, but they're forest cacti, like a Christmas cactus. You know, Christmas cactus don't have thorns because they grow in a forest in a tree where there's a lot of moisture. They don't need thorns to keep away animals from eating the leaves. So, um, and a lot of the epiphyllums are, you know, stuck on other plants. They're rooting into it and things. Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, I mean, think like the, what's called the epidendrum orchid. Mm -hmm. Those are orchids, real orchids that are called the reed stem orchids. Those take the same basic conditions as an epiphyllum. Oh. Same potting mm -hmm. media, same temperature, same light, pretty similar. Well, the other thing I was thinking is, this is the second time I've, I've heard your the same lecture. I saw the one on a master, the Master Gardener uh, oh, yeah. virtual website. And I, I noticed that somebody else is asking in the chat about where they could buy the book because I'm realizing I need to go get that book because I already forgot what you said the first time. <laughs> so. Well, I was saving that for the end, but we could do that right now. Is that okay, Karen? <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Sure. Okay, so um, my website is just the name of the book, howorchidsrebloom.com. And in there, there's a tab where you go buy the book. And um, I did take it off of Amazon. 
because some people are saying, I don't want to buy your book on Amazon. I want to buy it directly from you. So I, and the thing is with Amazon, I had to charge more to make 32 cents a copy than, I mean, I, so I just took it off that. So now if you go to my website, I think it's um, like 19.99 plus shipping. And, and I'll sign all the copies now because they come right to me. And because we're right near the holidays, um, if you're, you know, people order this through the website in the next few days or so. I mean, I drive all around the county almost every day of the week, you know, not Saturday, Sunday, not sometimes. But anyways, um, I would be willing, you know, to get them to people as gifts for the holidays to deliver them, you know, if, if it matches up with my schedule, and my route from where I'm at from day to day. But if you do that soon, I can mail them out. Um, I usually send it media mail to make it inexpensive. And I think if, you, if I got it out by Thursday, you'd get it by Christmas day if you're wanting to get it for that. But um, yeah, you just go to my website, howorchidsrebloom.com, and there's the buy the book tab, and it'll you just input your information. Um, the other place, I think the only place that's selling it right now is Walter Anderson Nursery at both locations. And I think they sell it for $24.99 plus tax. So that's another place that you go tomorrow and get your own copy like right away. Um, yes. So thank you. I saw, very much. I saw that. I, I saw one. I don't one know if I mentioned that. This is part of my <laughs> retirement plan. <laughs> we, we think you're going to retire well. Um, I hope so. I, I got my book and it's autographed. So that I can uh, vouch for it works off the web website. Um, yeah, and if what, you want to have me sign it to somebody else, just make a note of that when you, I think you can have a note or send it, send me an email, you know, mm -hmm. sign it to this person because it's a gift or something like that. Okay, we have another question. What do I need to do if the buds on my phalaenopsis are drying out? Right. So in chapter 10 of my book, um, chapter 10. There's a, it's just called Diagnosing Orchid Problems. And in there, there's a, a chart that says, what causes bud blast? Something like that. It's a whole one page thing that what are the reasons that orchid flower buds dry up and fall off before they open. I mean, that's one of the most common questions out there. So there's a whole section just on that. And almost always what causes that is a sudden change in environment. Uh, like for instance, you buy an orchid, you know, it's been in a greenhouse, it goes from there to some traumatic environment like a Trader Joe's, and then you take it home, you know, who knows? But moving it from cold to warm to cold to warm or watering it like every two days, all those types of things can do that or having it somewhere where you brush against the flower spike because it's sitting on your desk and you get up and you brush against it, that can cause that to happen. You know, sudden disturbances in the environment are usually what cause that. And, you know, without seeing it, it's hard to say, but, um, but then the, the chart that's in the book, you can go through it and look and say, well, which one of these things that I do and then stop doing that. That's probably the way to go about it. So. Good advice. Um, there's a question. Well, oh, I says, have a question. Nobody's answered. We can get to that one. Nobody's asked this one yet, but we'll, whoever's next is fine. I'll get to mine. <laughs> <laughs> maybe somebody will ask it, but it, it'll come. Maybe it'll this come. is it. Let's see. Uh, she has a question about a new root on her orchid, so, but I'm going to have to turn it over to her to be able to tell you more. Karen. Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, I have my orchid here with me. And it's uh, making two new shoots, which pleases me very much. But I also want to ask about this root. Can you see this big, long root here? I'm trying. Oh, there it is. I see you. OK, yeah. So what about that root? So does it need to be inside the pot? Well, I guess that would be nice, but if your orchid is growing lots of roots outside the pot, it may be that it doesn't like being in the pot. So often when you see, well, you just have one root, so that may not be an issue at all. But if you see lots of orchids roots on top of the pot, it may be that all the roots in the pot are dead. And it often works just fine for people to have it in a high humidity environment, like a, a window by the kitchen sink, and that'll work. And they don't realize they need to repot it because it's so humid that the roots are just fine. But one thing you don't want to do is cut it off. And that's a real oh. common question where people say, well, I have all these roots coming out. Can I cut them off? Can I cut them off? Like, I don't know what this is, thing is. Why do people want to cut the roots off? But, but don't cut the roots off. No. And I would say not tuck it back in there because you might bruise it or break it. You know, again, they're epiphytes. Their roots are just going anywhere trying to find something. As soon as they find something, they stick on it. You know, if you take your orchid and put it next to a wall, 
the roots will stick to the wall someday. I guarantee you it will, uh, depending on the type of orchid. But um, that's not a bad thing. Um, and if you don't like looking at it, I, I it may turn it around. <laughs> like oh, some people don't like seeing the roots. Is that an indication that I should repot or, or get a bigger pot? Yeah, possibly. I guess that'd be one of my next questions would be, when is the last time you repot it and how long have you had that orchid? I've had it three years and I've never repotted it. So based on what I said about repotting that you'd have to repot your orchid every few years, yes, you should repot it. And not necessarily right now, because we're going into winter um, and sometimes the days, we have a lot more light here than other parts of the country. But usually for most parts of the country, I say don't repot your orchids going into winter because the day length is shorter, there's often more clouds, and there may not be enough light for it to pull out of the repotting event quickly. But here in San Diego, there's just a lot more light. And, um, but I would say, take it out of the pot, look at the roots. If the roots look healthy, I would say, don't do anything till spring. If all the roots in the pot look dead, damaged, uh, mushy, then I would say repot it now. Okay. Yeah. I'm afraid though that, I mean, it's the new shoot or the new stem is already developing and- You have a new flower spike on there? Yes. Okay, two. then yeah, then don't repot it because it's happy. No two need to repot it. I have two. <laughs> yeah, okay. no need to repot it then. All right, thank you. We have another question and that is about our San Diego tap water. Is it okay for watering orchids or should it be some other water distilled or drinking or filtered or? Yeah, and that's one of those personal preference things. I'm quite sure that um, anybody with any advanced degree that has any knowledge about orchids in San Diego water would say, yeah, that stuff's totally bad. If you go to an orchid society club meeting, yeah, let's say, oh, that stuff's totally bad. Well, I use it and they rebloom okay. You know, but what you don't want is plants sitting in standing water. That's bad. Like if I look at an orchid, you say, oh, this orchid's not doing very well. If I see a big salt encrusted ring on the bottom two inches of the pot, I know what's wrong. It's been sitting in standing water. The roots are rotted. Um, yeah, if you can water your orchids with distilled water, that's much better. Um, I have one house plant that somebody gave me that I do water with distilled water because otherwise the leaf tips burn. One of, you know, the calatheas um, or maranta prayer plants. If you use tap water, you always get brown tips on it. That's just how that plant is. But in our tap water here. But um, again, it's personal preference. If you get into species orchids and little ones on a stick and stuff like that, then yeah, maybe you're using some other kind of water. But if you've got, you know, Phalaenopsis orchids as house plants, I'm not going to say don't use tap water because it's better than no water. <laughs> you know. Would you leach a salt filled orchid? Well, yeah, if I saw an orchid that had all these salt and crust around the bottom of the pot, I'd take it out of there, get rid of that pot and use a new one. Okay. Because, you know, it's okay. a lot of cleaning that's... to get that off of there. But yeah, um, but yeah, and usually it's a, it's a sign. More water. Yeah, usually that, that, that's a sign to repot it. If you see lots of salt around the bottom of the pot, um, assuming that the orchid was in that pot and it wasn't just repotted with that old pot and it looks like it was in it. But, you know, again, right. if there's a salt encrusted ring, that means the plant was sitting in standing water for a length of time. And that means it's excluding air from getting into the pot. The roots are rotting and that can affect how the plant grows and definitely affect how it reblooms. And you see that when you buy orchids in these cachet pots like this, you know, this is the orchid in its plastic pot. You see lots of nice, healthy greenish roots because it's in a plastic pot. You know, there's some orchid roots are slightly photosynthetic and some of this might just be algae growing on the roots. But then you have this cachet pot. Now I like using them because it acts as a saucer. But in the wrong hands, this can be spell certain death. If you're like watering copiously and letting it sit in standing water for a week at a time, uh, you're going to have problems. So um, often it's good to get them out of those cachet pots right away. Um, let's mention this real quick. So you notice how this Phalaenopsis orchid, it's got the spike bent over like this. Anyone have any guesses why it's like that? Because... I will tell you, it's Gravity. so it will fit on a shipping rack. Oh, that's the only reason. I mean, that's that's labor, labor and materials. Why would they do that? It's to fit on a shipping rack. And so, one of the reasons your orchids can fail to rebloom, having to do with its origin, is that um, 
Many orchids today have reached the unbecoming status that poinsettias have as being disposable home decorations. So for a little humorous digression, I'm gonna read the last page in the orchid book called An Aspiration. It's just a couple paragraphs. People like, you know, they have an author do a class, you gotta hear them read something from the books. Okay. So when I first started writing this book, I decided to travel to the big island of Hawaii to talk to the big guys. I wanted to find out how the big commercial orchid growers did business. What were their tricks for growing orchids? Were there any new varieties out there on the horizon? In one of my meetings, I asked the owner if there were any newer orchid varieties coming out that would be easy to rebloom as houseplants. He instantly started laughing and naturally I had to ask why. He boldly yet truthfully stated, I grow disposable home decorations and I can't be concerned whether they rebloom or not. So, wow, so I instantly understood what he meant. He continued, I only grow winning orchids. Do you wanna know what a winning orchid is for me? Of course I said, yes. So he goes, a winning orchid does three things for me. I need to grow orchids that go from their flask to their flower in 18 months. You need to have a flower that catches your eye and grow a flower spike 18 inches tall or less so it'll fit on my shipping racks. That's a winning orchid for me. So um, I put that in there because, yeah, it's true that a lot of orchids are just being sold as disposable home, home decorations, just like a poinsettia or a, a forest bulb in a pot or all kinds of things. Now, given the fact that orchids are long-lived plants and they don't take up a lot of space, they don't require a lot of care, why not rescue a whole bunch of them? You know, there's people, I mean, it's my business. So people are giving me orchids all the time and I'm giving them away all the time. I don't have that many. I've got a few that are mine, but I just give them away. I turn them around, get them to bloom and rebloom, give them to people. But um, you can do that. I mean, with like literally like four square feet of space, you could have like 20 plants and when they rebloom, you could take them to your library or retirement residency or whatever. But um, a lot of people have these plants and they're just like not taking care of them. And it's easy to recover them. And that's why I put that in there. It's an aspiration to start your own like orchid rescue group. I went, when I lived in Bellingham, you know, smaller community, I put ads in the papers that said, don't toss your house plants. Call Chuck the plant guy for a free pickup. You know, or call Chuck for a free pickup of your unwanted house plants. And sometimes I get orchids, but you know, just fix them up and give them away. But you can do that with orchids. I mean, they don't, again, don't take up a lot of space. You don't have to water them all the time. And it's easy, especially with this one. You know, one flower lasts five months. It likes the interior of your home. Everybody's got a spot for one of those to rebloom. And is there another question or should we come to my question? No, uh, no there are. There's two more questions and then okay. you get to go. So uh, Joan is asking how to get a flower shoot to regrow on a phalaenopsis. And right. Mary is asking the name of your sister's website for the pots and which of her pots are good for orchids. <laughs> okay, so let's do that one first. So I don't know if she has a website, but she's on Instagram. Okay. And her, her company is called June 13 Pottery. Guess what June 13 is? Not my birthday, hers. So anyways, yeah, so June 13 Pottery. Now she made that special the for word. Me. Yeah, June mm -hmm. and then one three. One three, okay. June one three pottery and that's okay. on Instagram. So like okay. at June one three pottery. And, mm -hmm. um, but she made that for me. I don't know how many of those she does, but just all kinds of things now because she has kilns at home. And um, so anyway, so that's the, that one question. The other one then okay. leads into my question, which how okay. do you get the flower spike to rebloom? So here's how I'd like to start by answering that question by asking another one that nobody's asked yet. What do I do when my orchid's done blooming? That's a huge what, question. What do I do, Chuck, when my orchid stops blooming? Well, you know, somebody emailed me. This is like last year, the year before. Oh. You know, Chuck, I'm really liking your book. You know, what do I do to get my orchid to rebloom when it's done blooming? And I said, keep reading. That's chapter seven. So yeah, chapter seven is, what do, you know, what do I do when my orchid's re done blooming? What do I do? So with most orchids, like a cymbidium or the corsage orchids or like this, um, Oncidium orchid here, they make a spike. And again, they're using creating a whole new growth shoot each year or a couple times a year to make leaves and then bloom. So when that orchid is done blooming, or like say this one here, this one that I have here, it's hard to show because the flower spikes over two feet long. But when this one's done blooming, I'm gonna cut off the flower spike as far back as I can without hurting the plant and leaving a little stump so I can prove to my friends that actually did rebloom. 
So that's that kind of orchid. But there are some orchids that will rebloom several times on the same flowering stem. And that's this kind of orchid here. So, you know, we mentioned this one a lot. This is the most common orchid that people have. It's easy to rebloom in their home because again, the home is warm. This plant likes it warm. There's not really direct sun in the middle of your room unless you're right at the window. This plant does not like direct sun. One flower lasts for five months. Not too many cut flowers do that. Some dry flowers will. But the other thing that's nice about this is it'll rebloom several times on the same flower spike. So that makes it very appealing. So what do I mean? So what you do when your orchid is this type of orchid is done reblooming, the first thing you do is look at the tip of the spike. And you ask yourself two questions. That's all you have to do. You look at the tip of the spike and you say, is it dead or is it alive? If it's alive, you do nothing because the plant can just continue to bloom off the end. And I've seen Phalaenopsis orchids where the, the flowers hang lower than the pot. You have to prop up the pot because the flowers are hanging way down. Um, so that's at the tip of the spike is brown. So let's see if what this one looks like, if I can show that. So here's, here's a flower spike with Phalaenopsis orchid. All the flowers have fallen off and you look at the tip, which I doubt this is gonna show up on that camera. But when I look at this tip, it looks like it's just dry and brown. So that means it's not alive. So then what do you do? So again, if the tip looks okay, it's like kind of burgundy and shiny or green and shiny, you don't do anything. It's could rebloom there. But if it is dead here, this is the important part. What do you do next? So when an orchid is done blooming and all the flowers have fallen off, let me uh, here. You want to remove that part of the spike that all the flowers were on. So you go back and you look for like the first flower, which was here and you cut this off. I did not do this because I wanted to have this orchid for illustrative purposes. So this tip of this spike is brown, like it's dead. So we're gonna go back all these, where these flowers were, we're gonna remove all that to here. And then from one of these notches or nodes on the stem is where the new spike comes out. See, there's a new spike. It's coming out from the, the node that's closest to where the last flower was. So the thing is, if we remove the distal tip of the spike, we preserve all these nodes for this to rebloom. So that's one example there. Let me show you another one. I think it's important for people to see this so that way they know they're doing the right thing. So here's one here where the flower spike was dead and I cut it off, preserving as many good nodes as I could. And then here's the new spike coming out straight out of there. Or if it wasn't from there, it might be from over here or it might be down here coming out of this node. But this one's blooming right here two nodes down from the top, there's a new spike. Now it'll be probably two months before that has flowers that open. So there's that one. If you get really lucky, every once in a while, you'll get one like this. Or here's one where the tip is still good, so I'm doing nothing, yet it's reblooming here, 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 and over here. It's got four new spikes on the top, and in addition to that, it's got a new spike coming out of the bottom. So this is a question that always comes after what I just said. Well, what happens if I already cut the whole spike off? You just wait until a new one comes out like this. And the spikes come out from where the roots come out, where a leaf joins the central axis or what you call a node, where the leaf joins the central axis of the stem is where new roots and new shoots and new flower stems emerge. Let's see if I have another example here. Not that one. Yeah, here we go. So this one I showed you where it's reblooming a spike off of this node up here. But at the same time, these have all been outside. There's a new flower spike coming out down here. On the other side, there's a new root coming out. The new root is smooth and pointing down. The new spike has got little notches on it and it's pointing up. So. Okay, so that should help to get the new spike to come out. So again, we'll go back to, if you cut off the whole flower spike, that's okay. You just gotta wait for a new one to come out. And this is the time of year where that happens. But if they're outside or near an open window, it's more likely to happen. Like all my years of working at Walter Anderson Nursery, which is when I first moved here, 
I thought it's best to work at a nursery so I understand the lay of the land and the, you know, the places and stuff before I start you know, going to people's homes. But the first thing I noticed right away at Walter Anderson Nursery is that every Phalaenopsis orchid that was outside made a new flower spike in October, November, December. You know, like if they don't sell, we put them in this one spot and they all rebloom. I was like, wow, this is easy here. So, um, but that's happening right now. And again, if your orchid is not making a newer flower spike right now, it might mean that some aspect of its native habitat was missing six months ago. And so that's catching up with the plant. Like, because you think like, you know, people like plant their little pots of annuals of things. And you go away on vacation, you're gone for a month. You come back, nobody watered the pot. Here's that one impatient, that little old beetle. It's still got a couple flowers. Like why couldn't orchids be like that? Well, they're not. They're like really long lived plants. Whereas lobelian and patients know that we, hey, we got to make some flowers because we're going to die within a year. But orchids are long lived plants. And they can say, well, you know, it's a little too cold. I'm just not going to flower this year. <laughs> and that's what happens. They're just like, not going to do it. Um, or if it's too warm, that's a, for cool growing orchids and it's too warm, the plants respire too much and there's not enough energy left to make a flower spike. Like, you know, for an orchid to make a flower spike, as many of you could probably relate, it's like raising kids. It's the most expensive thing you'll ever do in your life. So if it's a little too warm, the orchid's just like, no, we'll just wait till conditions a little better. I'm not going to spend any money on flowers this year. So, but, um, but that's a big reason why, like if your Phalaenopsis, again, has not made a flower spike right now, it may have to do with what happened this summer. But I hope that answered that question about how to get it to make a new flower spike. I mean, ask the two questions. If the tip looks healthy or not healthy. If it looks healthy, do nothing. If it looks not healthy, cut off that distal tip of the spike to preserve all those nodes. And that helps it to make a new spike. Great. Um, one more question and then we'll be done. And it okay. is, what spot in a home is best for the orchid while it's waiting to rebloom? A bathroom with a window. I'm assuming it would. What aspect? Uh, the uh, what part of the house? Which way the the bathroom was facing would be important. But the question yeah, is, what what part in the home is best for an orchid waiting to rebloom? That part of the home that best mimics the the conditions found in that orchid's native habitat. Yeah, you because know, a lot of times, yeah, you'll, you'll have your cymbidium outside in the proper environment, but you bring it inside while it's blooming. But most of the year, you know, almost all the year, you have your orchid in an environment that mimics the native habitat. So let's say, um, you know, you have your cymbidium orchid, you bring it inside and you enjoy the flower spike for a month or two, then you put it right back outside where it was growing all summer, where it made that flower spike. And if you don't, it maybe is not going to rebloom again, because, you know, you have that environment where it creates the flower spike, if it does that, then that's where it needs to be. You know, so uh, like I said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. But, you know, again, it depends on the orchid. It depends on your home. Like, you know, they're neighbors. They said, well, I put mine in my kitchen window and it didn't rebloom, but hers did. Well, the homes are totally different. The microclimates within each home is totally different. The way the windows face, somebody could have a big tree in front of their window that they don't have. And so the light level is totally different. Um, the other thing that goes along with it that I hadn't mentioned, but it's good to mention, is that light interacts with temperature. So there are some orchids like a cymbidium that like lots of light, but not heat. And then there are some orchids that like light, and they like it kind of warm. And um, so you have to be careful growing orchids indoors. The ones that like lots of light, if you put in a sunny San Diego window that faces west and gets really hot in the afternoon, it's probably too hot for most orchids. But you, there's a whole chapter in my book on how to know your microclimate in your home. And then it, I just kind of walk around your home, a fictitious home, and explain, well, here's this condition. Now we're walking over here. Here's this condition that's best for this kind of orchid. But near a window that you can open is usually good just so you get that depression and temperature at night. Yeah. We um, very very interesting and helpful well-organized talk the handouts are a treasure thank you everybody's really enjoying the um the information and i'm quite sure a lot of people will be buying the book because it's a real uh, answer to all the questions that we have and that you have that we didn't have <laughs> nancy yeah, and has her hand up 
Nancy. You're muted, Nancy's iPhone. Oh, sorry. Okay. So I wonder if you'd say something about growing Sobralias outside. I mean, they have to be outside, but yeah, about conditions for Sobralias. Yeah, um, not too hot. Um, like I have a couple of clients with Sobralias and they're, um, yeah, orchids are quite large. And yeah. um, I think the best <laughs> environment for that is like, um, like where do you live? What part of San Diego? I live in University City, so it's fairly coastal. We get a lot of fog. Yeah. But uh, should it be shade or full sun? Well, and then that, that asks the question of what time of day is the shade? The main thing, what you're doing is avoiding hot afternoon sun. So if you can have it under the okay. dappled light of a tree, that works well. Okay. Or like an Eastern exposure where you get the morning sun and the afternoon is shaded so it's not so hot. Yeah. Uh, like one of the nicest ones I've seen, I have a client Coronado and they have a giant, uh, it's a giant magnolia in the front yard. And then they have all these, uh, there's Sobralius, Cymbidiums, and staghorn ferns up along the front of the house. And this tree shades it with dappled light all the time. The canopy is really high, so it's real bright. And But, mm -hmm. you know, not a windy spot, though, because the stems will fall over. If it's like at a hilltop, it's real windy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then, Karen, you were saying something right there. I forget. I forget, um, too. But thank you. <laughs> I, sure. I mean, this has so, been great. Um, um, everybody order his books, book at howorchidsrebloom.com. And if he's going to be in your area, he will deliver drop ship personally in the county. So um, you could get it and give it for Christmas or New Year. So, yeah. Well, and I'll just end saying, you know, there, there are aspects of the book, you know, there's so much limited time, but after almost every chapter is a question and answer section. And I did this because of when I started doing this class years ago, I found that the questions that other people have were the most informative. So I will say any question anybody's asked is not, is in this book. There's not one question anybody had that's not in here. So, um, most chapters have a question and answer section at the end. And they're just the questions I've been asked over the years, the most common ones. Um, occasionally someone asks like a real detailed technical question that's not in here, like Sobralia, not in here. You're not gonna find that at Trader Joe's, I guarantee you. But, um, but if you just read the orange boxes of gardening slogans in the question and answer section, you don't even have to read the rest of the book. You'll know more than 99% of the population in this universe, I guarantee you. But again, it's just, yeah, the website is howorchidsrebloom.com. And on there, I also have an upcoming events tab. And this is my last, I like to do a lot of free classes. And this is the last one of the year. Um, starting next year in February, I'll be doing this basic class with a book signing event at the Walter Anderson Nursery in Poway. That's in February. I don't think that one's on the website yet. And then in um, March, I will be the guest speaker for the monthly meeting of the um, Lakeside Garden Club. And that class will be on combining color and texture in your garden and landscape. And that's kind of a fun class. Um, that's basically a class that shows you how to have the eye. You know, can you teach somebody to have the eye? So that's what that class is about. And then I think in May, I'll be doing this same class again, a live class uh, for the Point Loma Garden Club in May. And um, yeah, well, thanks for again for having me. Um, again, oh, like I said, I could talk you. about plants all night. Um, yep. That's what I do anyways, but I know we have to stop at some point. So I will let you determine when we stop. Yeah, I think that we have come to the end of the meeting and I um, I saved the chat so that I have a record of what the questions uh, were and I can send that to you, Chuck, if that's something that you're interested in. And everybody remember that in January, our first in-person meeting in an Eon is on um, a Tuesday, not a Monday, at three, not at six. And uh, if you're gonna, if you're willing to help at the check-in and everything, send your email to volunteer at sdhort.org. And thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chuck. This has been great. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you been wonderful. All right, everybody.
Bye. Go and be free. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.